Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here in Amherst for our reunion. We're really excited. This is our first program. We're off to a great start. Uh, our, our speaker tonight is Nancy Pick. She's class of 1983. And Nancy Pick has worked for many years as a journalist and a writer, and some of her recent, recent publications include The Rarest of the Rare, Stories Behind the Harvard Museum of Natural History. This was published in 2004. Uh, a book about some of the things you were just looking at in the Bineski Museum. It's called Curious Footprints, Professor Hitchcock's Dinosaur Tracks and Other Natural History Treasures at Amherst College. This was published in 2006, and the book tells the unlikely story of Edward Hitchcock, the 19th century geologist and Amherst College president, who amassed the world's largest collection of dinosaur footprints. And strangely enough, he did not believe the tracks were made by dinosaurs, which if you visited the museum, you know, uh, that they are, in fact, dinosaur footprints. Uh, Nancy also wrote, co-wrote The Writer and the Refugee, co-authored about Nancy's ancestral cousin, Etta Federn, an anarchist and feminist writer in pre-war Berlin, and is working on the Amherst Bicentennial book, forthcoming in 2020. Her next publication will be Do Plants Know Math? which is a co-authored multidisciplinary exploration of the patterns found in plants. Nancy is married to Amherst College Professor Lawrence Douglas, who teaches in the Department of Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought. And through her many exposures to Amherst, Nancy has acquired a host of weird and wonderful stories about the college that we're about to enjoy. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Can everybody hear OK? Barely. Closer? OK. All right, so first I want to point out, because it's not apparent, I guess, or obvious, I'm wearing mammoth earrings. <laughs> they're pink, they're bright pink. My husband said they look like flamingos or shrimp or something, but they're actually mammoths. <laughs> and um, I know they should be, they didn't have purple. Um, this also is my visitor badge. Um, this is from the centennial in 1921, so it has on it 1821 to 1921. <laughs> and I found it at a local antique store, and it made me pretty happy when I found it. <laughs> so, see, it, it may not look like a lot, but it's a real amateur relic. So this is, the, this is the kind of fun you can have when you get an assignment to write an Amherst Bicentennial book. So, um, I have, in fact, just finished writing this illustrated history book for the college, about the college. Uh, it's a coffee table book, as some would call it. And um, I'm not allowed to divulge the title, so I'll just tell you that it's called I, Mind, and Heart. Uh, and that is an allusion to him, to Amherst. We're all supposed to go, and I, and mind, and heart. Do you remember that song? So my husband's in the, on the car, in the car on the way over, he said, well, maybe we should just call it Ear, Nose, and Throat. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know for sure what the final title will be, but that's what we've been considering. And um, in the course of my research over the last three years, I've found this kind of vast trove of fascinating stories. So I'm going to highlight a few of them tonight. Um, but my real mission here is to expand your vocabulary and there will be a quiz following my presentation. <laughs> this is Zephaniah Swift Moore. Yeah. So he abandoned a crummy little college called Williams in 1821 because it was too remote and he didn't think it would survive. I had read that he rode over the mountains to Amherst on a horse with a bobbed tail. And I thought, oh, that sounds quaint, a bobbed tail. And then I realized what that really meant. It meant that the Williams students were so angry that they shaved his horse's mane off and they cut off its tail before he left as a sign of public humiliation. Uh, Moore must have had a big, strong horse because he weighed 240 pounds. And he preferred to wear old-fashioned knee breeches. Unfortunately, he survived less than two years on the job, seemingly succumbing to overwork as he tried to get Amherst College off the ground. In the beginning, Amherst College desperately needed a chapel. 
students had been praying, uh, which by the way, they did twice a day at dawn and at dusk in a church that was borrowed from the town's congregationalists. This is Johnson Chapel around uh, 1920. And as it turns out, its story is pretty amusing. So back in 1823, the advancement office um, was not, um, they weren't slouches in the advancement office. And they got wind of a fellow named Adam Johnson who lived in Pelham and who was a carpenter and who had amassed a considerable fortune and who had no heirs. And so none other than Samuel Fowler Dickinson, grandfather of Emily, an upright and somewhat imposing lawyer, made his way to Pelham and convinced Adam Johnson to rewrite his will and give Amherst $4,000 in return for which he would have his name forever in lights as Johnson Chapel. He was successful. Johnson died. Johnson may not have had children, but he did have a brother, and his brother was not happy about this situation. <laughs> So his brother sued Amherst College, and his brother won, claiming that um, Adam Johnson had not been of sound mind when he signed this revised will. And then Amherst appealed, and Amherst won an appeals court, and so Amherst College did get its $4,000, and it did get its chapel. And um, the, uh, the brother was still angry, and so he wrote something called a burlesque will and he used quotes from the Bible in it to condemn the Amherst trustees. <laughs> All right, now how many of you knew that this was how Johnson Chapel began? Yeah, see, this is, this is the great thing about doing the research for this book. People do not know this story. Okay, but many of you must have been members of the anti vaninian Society when you were at Amherst. Just raise your hand if you were a member of the anti vaninian Society. Okay. It's quite a lot of fun to say, by the way, especially if you're into being puritanical. Does anybody know what anti veninian means? Okay, it's, it's, you're a little close to that, yeah. <laughs> That's a good guess. Um, so, venenate is to infect with poison. So the anti venetian society was the anti-poison society. It was founded by members of the faculty in 1830 because they were genuinely worried about their students' health. Members had to abstain from smoking tobacco, drinking alcohol, except for wine at the Lord's Supper, and yes, from using opium. In the mid-1800s, opium purchased in Turkey was coming into Boston Harbor with the rise of the China trade, and obviously the drug had reached as far as Amherst. In short, the opioid epidemic is nothing new. Uh, technically speaking, opium is a natural der derivative of poppies, whereas an opioid can be a synthetic. As late as 1871, more than half of the student body was still enrolled in the anti venetian Society, and one professor kept a list of all its members uh, over time on a scroll that was 23 feet long. So, I'll just give people a second to get settled here. Um, in its first 50 years, Amherst produced quite a few foreign missionaries, 79 to be precise. Perhaps the most unfortunate of all was this young fellow, Henry Lyman. He grew up in Northampton, and he began Amherst as a card player and a partier. But in 1827, when Amherst experienced the second of its many Christian revivals, Lyman became a believer. He went on to Andover Theological Seminary and following ordination as a minister, he left for Java where the Dutch East India Company had its headquarters with his young wife as a missionary. So he had an assignment to go deep into the island of Borneo. And to be honest, he saw a lot of warning signs such as human skulls hanging in little baskets. <laughs> Many people told them not to push on into the interior, but they had a mission after all. So on June 28, 1834, they encountered a group of 200 warriors from the Batak people, and Lyman was shot with his own musket. 
and then he was devoured, likely with salt and a squeeze of lime, according to the scholars of Batak culture. <laughs> Ultimately, Lyman's skull was found and sent back to his widow in Boston, along with a hat and a book written in English. A memorial stone stands in Bridge Street Cemetery in Northampton, saying that he suffered a violent death. He was only 24. Anybody go to school with this guy? <laughs> so, uh, I'm a huge fan of Professor Edward Hitchcock. He's the one who amassed all of the dinosaur tracks. And um, he had many interests, and one of them was that he, um, he not only wanted his students to be healthy and be members of the Anti-Venetian Society, but he wanted them to understand their own bodies. And in the 1840s, he lamented that the college had not a single anatomical model or preparation, not even a skeleton, nor any of the large works on anatomy. And of course, the instruction given must be very meager. It seemed a shame to profess to give young men a liberal education and yet leave them ignorant of their own bodies so curiously and wonderfully made. So Hitchcock decided to purchase a life-sized human mannequin model from France. He spent $700 out of his own pocket. That would be like $23,000 today. A mannequin, M-A-N-I-K-I-N, a model of the human body, not to be confused with like a store mannequin. So this was Dr. Louis Ozu. Uh, his models were made from a top secret kind of paper mache. And this one could be taken apart to display various organ systems. So in fact, Amherst's model has not survived, but not even an eyeball. But I did find one of these life-size human models made by Ozu in excellent condition at Cambridge University, and that's the picture of it. Professor Hitchcock, armed with his paper mache model and a new human skeleton, then developed 25 lectures for Amherst students on anatomy and physiology. You might observe that the mannequin is, well, not quite anatomically correct. I mean, Amherst was founded by Puritans, after all. This is Morgan Library, which represented a huge improvement. One alumnus from the class of 1849 recalled what library privileges were like during his days as a student, when the library was still located on the third floor of Johnson Chapel. The college library was a wonderful thing then. It was solemnly opened one hour a week by one of the solemnest of the professors, and the management seemed as if it were meant to keep the students from getting at and seeing the books rather than the liberal policy of today. Every case was kept locked as if we were thieves and the books were jewels. When Morgan Library opened in 1853, for the first time, the college had a proper library. This amazing program dates from 1875, at the end of freshman year for the class of 1878. They held a mock funeral for their math books when they finished their required classes, geometry, algebra, trigonometry, and conic sections. Oh, the rituals students enjoyed in the 19th century. math e -matica was dead. So any classicists among you? The Latin date here means July 2nd. Before the Ides, there were the knowns, and I-V-L, that was Julius. Yes, they still had classes in July. Ila lacrimatur, he weeps. And as for that Greek quote, in the 19th century, all Amherst students could read it. You realize that. It was the language of the New Testament. And the quote here is from Sophocles' play, Electra, about bearing offerings for the dead. The, festivios, the festivities ended with whoop, inflammatio defuncti, the burning of the dead, namely the math books. Loomis's geometry and Olney's first principle of algebra up in smoke. And here they are, those fun-loving freshmen dressed for their mathematical funeral pageant. Don't you wish you'd been there? 
they really are amazing, those costumes. So this is Appleton Cabinet, where the Natural History Collection resided before it was moved to the Pratt Museum and then moved again to Bineski. In the forefront is a plaster cast of a megatherium. I told you you're going to have a vocabulary quiz. Does anybody know what a megatherium is besides my husband who cheats? OK, a megatherium is a giant ground sloth that once roamed South America. None other than Emily Dickinson must have found out about the megatherium, even if she didn't leave her house ever to view it or anything else, uh, because the Amherst Archives owns this scrap of paper on which she whimsical whimsically wrote, science is very near us. I found a megatherium on my strawberry. <laughs> Don't ask me what she meant. Walker Hall. Uh, this is a stereoscope view, and it would show you a 3D image through a viewer, but you'll have to make do with mono, although when there's show and tell afterwards, I do have a little surprise for you. Uh, as you might know, Walker Hall had a terrible fire in 1882, barely a dozen years after it was built at a cost of $120,000, which was more than the cost of all the other campus buildings combined. Walker Hall was then Amherst Temple of Science. Notice like a recurring theme here at Amherst. Uh, hopefully the new one will not burn. Uh, the fire took place on the night of March 28th during spring break when the campus was dead quiet and no one was inside. Little survived except what was in the college vault. One terrible loss was Amherst's world-class mineralogical collection with 25,000 specimens. As W.S. Tyler wrote in his history, the minerals of Professor Shepard, a collection of gems, a cabinet of singular beauty and priceless worth, even these minerals, strange to tell, were reduced to ashes. Scarcely a trace of them could be found in the debris after a long and diligent search. So was it arson? A report in the New York Times said the fire seemed suspicious, especially given that there had been fires in two commercial buildings in town that also started in the attic. There were no obvious causes given that. There was no light lit inside the building that night. There, were there was no one smoking inside. There were no rags stored in the building. And because it was a vacation, no one had lit the furnace for several days. Definitely weird. Uh, so using insurance money and generous donations, Walker Hall would soon rise from the ashes. It's nearly identical replacement, again built of local Massachusetts granite, and this time more fireproof opened in 1884, just two years later. Tyler described the rebuilt hall as more than ever, the archives, the treasury, the capital, the acropolis of Amherst College. OK, another vocabulary word for you. How about goniometer? I love saying goniometer. If you arrived at Amherst between 1860 and 1945, here's what happened. You got measured from head to toe. Edward Hitchcock Jr., better known as Old Doc, who was professor of hygiene and physical education, measured everything from the girth of your calf to the length of your left foot. He also measured your lung capacity and your pilosity. Whoops. Any guesses? Your hairiness. You got measured when you arrived at Amherst as a freshman, and you got measured again at the beginning of every year to chart your growth, and um, if all went well, your increase in strength. This goniometer was used to measure the angles of students' faces. And then you and your classmates' aggregated statistics were analyzed and published, con uh, contributing to a discipline called anthropometrics. Anthropometrics, measuring of man the science of measuring the size and proportions of the human body. The practice uh, would be dropped during World War II when Nazis gave it a sinister twin, uh, tinge. And these are Calvin Coolidge's anthropometric measurements from his freshman and senior years, calibrated in millimeters. He grew nine millimeters during the first four years, uh, but he, he got only slightly stronger overall. And his pilosity 
was 2.5. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Amherst was a bastion of fraternities. Uh, during the early 1900s, there were, I, I don't know, something, the vast majority of Amherst students belonged to fraternities, more than 90%. And they had some pretty funky rituals. Um, so they had these initiation rites accompanied by these amazing handwritten letters. And this one belonged to um, a freshman named Edson McRae from the class of 1906 and he was joining Phi Delta Theta. Among the directives, thou shalt place at the hour of 7.45 and one half p.m. one basket of the fruit of the vine known as grape at the back door of Barrett Gymnasium. As soon as thou hast fulfilled this edict, hasten to thine unholy hovel. Freshmen were really, <laughs> they were really bullied, I have to say. And another one, beware do and enact all the commands herein stated. The minions of King Phi never sleep. They watch over thee, do not transgress. Disobey once and thy bones shall become the food of the carrion crow and the ravaging wolves. This is the mood of the great King Phi. Obey. Just imagine if freshmen got these <laughs> nowadays. So um, Edson McRae became a star picture, pitcher on the Amherst baseball team. Uh, Sadly, he died on his 29th birthday from a strep infection, and I hope that this was not linked to his failure to follow his fraternity's orders. Here's another um, wonderful initiation letter from 1895, this time from a student named Redfern being initiated into Chi Phi. Freshmen, do not eat the peanuts. All right, this is everybody's favorite object in the archives. It's the Amherst football doll. Uh, I really don't have a lot of information about it, but um, the, libraries, the librarians usually have it on display down in the archives. And um, I did find a photo of a similar one from Princeton from about 1910 with a tag saying it was made in Germany. I think really we should have these made for the bicentennial. Okay, anybody see what's odd about this Amherst diploma? Yes, it's a Bachelor of Science degree from 1916. Amherst began offering a BS in 1872, and this was probably tied to the opening of Walker Hall, the Temple of Science in 1870. Um, and there was also a trend uh, among other institutions of higher education to start offering bachelor of science degrees. Um, students who applied for the course of science had slightly different admissions requirements, and they did not have to be competent in ancient Greek. Amherst conferred Bachelor of Science degrees for more than 50 years until the college was turned into a military training facility for World War I in 1917. Uh, only a small minority of students, typically like fewer than 10 per class, uh, would receive a BS every year. Now, Charles Hamilton Houston was an amazing Amherst graduate from the class of 1915. Uh, for his brilliant legal strategy to end segregation, he was known as the man who killed Jim Crow. Starting in the 1930s, he argued many of the most important civil rights cases before the Supreme Court, attacking the concept of separate but equal. When he arrived at Amherst in 1911, Houston was the only African American in his class. Excluded from fraternity life, he often felt isolated, but he toughed it out, telling his father, anything that's worth having is worth sacrificing for. As an outstanding student, Houston was elected to Phi Beta Kappa and chosen to give a commencement address. When he told his professors he wanted to speak about the African-American poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the namesake of Houston's all-black high school in Washington, DC, they were unenthusiastic, saying they'd never even heard of Dunbar. Houston replied, I know it, but you will know him when I've finished. So um, I wanted to find out more about him, and I hired a researcher from the Folger Library to go walk across and look at the um, Amherst file of his papers at the Library of Congress. And they found this cartoon. 
<laughs> Nobody thinks of Charles Hamilton Houston as being a good cartoonist, but he, he was pretty good. Um, so note what the, the baseball players are doing as they run the bases. They're, um, one's smoking a pipe, and one's picking a flower, and I don't know what that guy is. <laughs> oh, that's the Williams pitcher, I guess. Uh, and do you, does anybody see what the score was? Yes. A little lopsided, right? So it was, it was Amherst 99, Williams 0. She may not look like Rosie the Riveter, but in a way she was. A taboo was broken in 1918 when Madeleine Boucher Utter became the first woman to teach in Amherst. Her job was only temporary, filling in while a professor of Romance languages served in military intelligence during World War I. It's uh, also interesting to note that later during World War II, there were three women that Amherst hired to teach biology and chemistry, again on a Rosie the Riveter basis. Madeleine Utter had not only a French bachelor's degree, but also an excellent pedigree. Her father, Ferdinand Boucher, was a professor of French at Harvard. Isn't she gorgeous? <laughs> I like her firm mouth. I am pleased to report that in the game of Nobel Prizes, Amherst is winning. <laughs> Amherst is beating Williams by a score of five to two in terms of its alumni. But then there's the story of this geneticist, Herman Muller, who worked as a researcher at Amherst during World War II. Ostracized as a socialist, in 1940, he took an untenured position at Amherst. For five years, he taught biology classes and he researched spontaneous mutation rates in Drosophila fruit flies. Amherst then terminated, <laughs> they terminated his appointment. Uh, and despite his politics, Indiana University then took a risk and hired him to teach zoology. In 1946, just a year after he left Amherst, guess what happened? Muller won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Uh, in physiology or medicine for his discovery that x-rays can produce mutations. Uh, so we can call that the one that got away. This is kind of a wonderful quote I just found when I was Googling. To say that a man is made up of certain chemical elements is a satisfactory description only for those who intend to use him as a fertilizer. Another science story here. Professor David Todd graduated from Amherst in 1875 and then returned to his alma mater to teach astronomy. Under his initiative, Amherst built a new and much larger observatory in 1903, replacing the old one that had been attached to the octagon. And um, the college got a world-class telescope to match, a refractor with an 18-inch aperture whose excellent lenses took 15 months to grind. Uh, the telescope, which was made in Massachusetts by a famous firm called Alvin Clark & Sons, cost $12,000, which uh, is a lot of money. <laughs> Late in his career, Todd was befriended by Percival Lowell, a wealthy Harvard graduate who was obsessed with proving that Mars was inhabited. And part of that mission involved photographing the canals of the Red Planet, which he believed were made by Martians. It seems that Professor Todd found Lowell's ideas pretty convincing. Lowell recruited Todd to lead an expedition to Chile to observe and photograph Mars when it was in opposition close to the Earth and visible just above the southern horizon. For that exhibition, Todd removed Amherst's brand new telescope from the college observatory and packed it up for the long trip south. In the Atacama Desert of Chile, the Amherst telescope was set up outside, you see it here, without any dome or roof to protect it. The weather being predictably clear at that time of year, the telescope did not suffer any damage. The mission was successful in a way in that they obtained a lot of good photographs of Mars. Uh, so this is, that's Professor Todd, and that's his wife, Mabel Loomis Todd. It's a story for another day. <laughs> So, Percival Lowell made countless sketches of the canals he saw through the telescope, which were supposedly made by Mar Martians in a dying civilization. Yes, the Martians had once constructed a vast irrigation system. Of course they did. Um, and 
note, by the way, that these canals are not the same as the possible ancient stream beds that were recently observed during the Mars Explorers expeditions. More likely, scientists say, Loeb was actually mapping the veins of his own retinas, <laughs> which often appear to observers when using very high magnification. Anybody remember the steam tunnel? <laughs> if you lived in Coolidge, raise your hand. So there was, uh, and to some extent still is, this underground heating system that uh, covers most of the campus, all, from the powerhouse to me to Merrill Science Center. And I wanted to get some photos of the steam tunnels before they were demolished, when they um, demolished the social dorms, I'm sorry, uh, in order to make room for the new science center. And I, I wasn't able to track down the great like, steam tunnel stories I was hoping for, so if you have any, it's not too late, I could still put them in the book. Um, but one alum did tell me that he used to have these gatherings with friends in what they called the pillow room. So off, off of one of these um, steam tunnels, there was a room that was just full of like hundreds of foam pillows that Amherst stored um, for summer programs. <laughs> and I thought that was great. Uh, and lastly, these are not so weird, but I really do love them. These are bicentennial trees. They are outside of Sealy Dorm, which was once SIU. Um, these are huge sycamore trees, and they were planted in 1821 in front of the first president's house. The first president being? Thank you. Good, you passed your quiz. Uh, and the, the first president's house stood on that same site. And these young little trees were brought over from the town of Sunderland, which happens to be where we live. And um, Sunderland is also home to the largest sycamore east of the Mississippi. So the president's house was completed um, <coughs> even before Zephaniah Moore left that little known college called Williams to take over at fledgling Amherst. And lastly, Ah, if you ask to, I have try, I tried testing some younger graduates of Amherst today, and Sabrina, Sabrina has kind of disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, Sabrina may not make it as like a, you know, the symbolism is, I, it's, it's, I think Sabrina is featured in an Instagram post. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I think it will be interesting to see whether she makes the cut or not. She has, really? She does? Okay. She, you know, she may be reclaimed by the next generation. <laughs> um, so um, she was given to Amherst by Joel Hayden of Haydenville. I don't know, it's a little enclave near Northampton. It's a mill town. He, he owned a lot of mills. He was in cotton and brassworks and all kinds of industrial enterprises. And he had bought Sabrina from a British garden catalog and given it to his wife, and his wife, his wife hated her. <laughs> so, so, so Hayden was like, hey Amherst, I have a great idea. I'm gonna give you this lovely statue and you can put it outside of the octagon. And then she sat there for a few years in peace and then of course all hell broke loose and she became the object of all kinds of crazy pranks. Um, so with that, I will end, but what I do have that's very fun is um, if you take pictures of these stereoscopic views, and there are several in the Bicentennial book with your phone, and then you have a Google Cardboard, then you can see the 3D image on your phone. And so I have the Sabrina, if anybody wants to come take a look at it, you can look through my Google Cardboard. And I have some other like oddball show and tell items also, so come up afterwards if you want. And, um, and thank you so much for coming and listening to your Amherst stories. surprise for me was really the depth and, and uh, there's, Amherst has a really amazing African-American history 
and I didn't know about it until I started researching this book. Um, there are all kinds of firsts, and you know, I've certainly had people say like, oh, well, don't go overboard. I mean, there, it was still hard to be here as an early African American, but there were a lot of pretty um, landmark steps that Amherst took. I mean, everything from the first white fraternity to integrate to the first, um, you know, football team at a predominantly white school to have African American players to the second African American ever to get a BA degree in America to the third Phi Beta Kappa um, African American. You know, there's just like a long, long list of those. And for me, that was really fascinating and really moving. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised that there are no ghost stories. No ghost has appeared. Oh, can you find me one? It's not too late. I could add one quickly. <laughs> no, I was trying to find a murder story. Murder stories are great to have in books. Um, I got one into my first book, and, I, and people always, always talk about that. Um, I mean, we could, you know, we could just get rid of somebody this weekend. <laughs> you know, it would make a good ending for the book, and. Um, yeah, I did get Dan Brown to write a code for the book, though. So it, it, will, have, it will have a secret code in it. In 200 years, no one's been murdered? No one's been murdered? Not, not, that, not that I was able to find, no. Hard to imagine. I know. It's not too late. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> yes? So, no, it's interesting that you made this comment about the African-American history of Amherst and how interesting it was. So, if you were to think about the person who's going to do this book 100 years from now, mm. and looking at this period of time, what would you, can you project what you think they might look back Will on? Will you stop and Betsy from asking these really difficult questions? <laughs> <laughs> I just really look at this book, it's amazing. It's really amazing. <laughs> That's very sweet. And she didn't know I was going to ask these questions, sorry. Okay, so in fact, Biddy has an assignment. Um, so 100 years ago, Alexander Mickeljohn made predictions about Amherst now. And so Biddy has, I gave her the assignment for the afterword for the book, she has to make predictions for 100 years from now. So we will see what she comes up with. Do I personally have any, I just hope that it, we're not underwater. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good that all colleges are on hills because maybe that will mean that, you know, um, they'll survive. Mm -hmm. well, mentioned that she did attend some classes here. Really? Oh. That's fascinating. No, I hadn't heard that. I mean, she was at Mount Holyoke. Not for, officially or anything. But not officially. Her uncle's science classes or something. Ah. Well, I mean, she certainly went to Amherst Academy for prep school, for high school. And then, and then she famously hated Mount Holyoke because yes, it was so in the midst of one of those Holyoke. Christian conversion, exactly, you know that story. So everybody was asked to stand <laughs> if they, you know, accepted. And she sat. <laughs> so, um, but no, I didn't know that actually women were even... Um, well, it wasn't... It wasn't official, if, if right. It wasn't official. She just probably wandered over occasionally. Class. Yeah, she well, that makes sense with the megatherium, yeah. Yeah. you know, and she certainly went to lectures, we know that, yeah. So. Yes? You mentioned uh, Mabel Lewis Tom, Todd as a story for another time. I you certainly can't pass the story of Austin Dickinson and her, you know, completely aside in your history. No, oh, she's just a foot. You know, there's so much that's been written about that. There's a whole book that just came out, another one. So I. I tried to look for the things that people hadn't written so much about, because you didn't know any of these stories, right? Yeah. <laughs> See? Her husband's connection, Todd's connection to the, you know, Todd's ghost match, her connection to the Amherst Academy, which is the college. It's not that directly related to the college. To the college, is true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, come look, come look, come look at the, um, Stereoscopic view. You have this car to the box.